And right now, before we go, a final check of our weather with Chief Meteorologist Jason Kelly. Joe, you're not going to like, well, I don't know, this forecast will be great for most of us. You don't like the, the, the lower temperatures, but I think no. most of us are ready for them. Our daytime highs in the 80s, our morning lows in the 60s and 50s. A few locations could see the upper 40s by the oh. time we get into this weekend. Groundhog weather already. Something like that. Maybe well, I'm from South Florida, so I'm ready for some cold weather. You probably got the sweaters and the parkas out for this week. <laughs> don't you? I'm ready for it. <laughs> NBC Nightly News, Brian Williams next. We're back in 30 minutes with a lot more news. A lot of fallout tonight over new reports that the war in Iraq has made Americans and the world less safe from terrorists. The now famous Clinton temper. They ridiculed me for trying. They had eight months to try. They did not try. We got a rare look at it over the weekend. Tonight, what was behind it? When it comes to liquids on airplanes, the government rewrites the rules yet again. Tonight, travelers are being told, carry on within limits. And in New Orleans, the big return from misery, that is, to rebirth. The Superdome shining once again. And now the Saints go marching in. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Good evening. It is a report from the very top of U.S. intelligence, and it is meant for the boss, the president, and the very top of our government. The report, called the National Intelligence Estimate, or the NIE, has been leaked to the press. That is bad news for the Bush administration because of this report's conclusion that the war in Iraq has created a new generation of Islamic radicals and that the overall terrorist threat is now worse because this war has amounted to a huge recruiting tool for those who would do us harm. The political reaction to all this started today and we begin the broadcast here tonight with our chief White House correspondent David Gregory. For weeks, the president has successfully kept public attention on terrorism rather than the war in Iraq. Today, Democrats tried to change that by seizing on intelligence findings that the Iraq war has made the terror threat worse. Mr. Bush got the blame. But our own intelligence shows that much of what he said is simply untrue. His rhetoric is hollow, and his flawed Iraq policy has made us less safe. We are safer because we are on the offense against our enemies overseas. In recent weeks, the president has described gains in the war on terror and highlighted the high stakes of the fight, comparing al-Qaeda to Nazi Germany. Last month, before this intelligence report was public, Mr. Bush dismissed the idea that the invasion created more terrorists. I've heard this theory about, you know, everything was just fine until we arrived, and, you know, kind of, the, the, you know, stir up the hornet's nest theory. It just, it just doesn't hold water as far as I'm concerned. But today at a hearing organized by Democrats, retired military officers accused Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld of fueling terrorism by mismanaging the war. Iraq didn't have to be the way it was. We created this insurgency. We let it grow. We let it develop. We let it blossom. White House officials today downplay the intelligence estimate. And we have freedoms in that part of the world that we never had before. And so in that sense, it is a success. But this is going to be a long, hard fight. It's a continuing fight. As White House officials campaign across the country for Republicans, the message is not about Iraq, but about the choice in November. For the sake of our security, this nation must reject any strategy of resignation and defeatism in the face of determined enemies. 43 days now until Election Day, and this debate over national security is getting louder and louder, with both sides convinced that whichever party wins this issue, Brian, will control Congress. Our chief White House correspondent here with us in New York tonight, David Gregory. David, thanks for that. For more on what is detailed in this NIE report, we turn now to NBC News chief foreign affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell. She's in our Washington newsroom tonight. Andrea, good evening. Good evening, Brian. Well, these conclusions are not a surprise. This is what we've been hearing from the CIA director, Mike Hayden, from the director of national intelligence, John Negroponte, in their recent speeches. The report is, you should understand, a consensus of the thinking of 16 intelligence agencies. It's classified. The only thing not classified, which we can share with you, is the title, which is Trends in Global Terrorism, Implications for the United States. 
But this is the first official report on these threats since the Iraq war, and it does go well beyond Iraq. Some of the other conclusions are interesting. The Internet has helped spread jihadist ideology. Cyberspace is now a, a haven for these operatives, and they're spread well beyond their original bases in places like Afghanistan. And they are not centrally controlled by Osama bin Laden, but they are self-generating cells who are inspired by bin Laden. So we've known some of these things, but when it comes to Iraq, they don't pull their punches. In the short term, the war has become a breeding ground and has made things worse, not better. Brian. Andrea Mitchell with more on this tonight from Washington. Andrea, thanks. This new NIE story is not the only story that broke this past weekend and is getting a lot more attention today. During an appearance on Fox News Sunday with host Chris Wallace, former President Bill Clinton ended up in a combative exchange after being asked why he didn't do more about Osama bin Laden. Why didn't you do okay, more, connect the dots, right. and put him out of business? All right, let's talk about it. I will answer all those things on the merits, but first I want to talk about the context in which this arises. I'm being asked this on the Fox network. Do you but, think you did enough, sir? No, because I didn't get him. Right. But at least I tried. That's the difference in me and some, including all the right-wingers that are attacking me now. They ridiculed me for trying. They had eight months to try. They did not try. I tried. So you did Fox's bidding on this show. You did your nice little conservative hit job on me. But I want to know how many people in the Bush administration you asked this question of. I worked hard to try to kill him. I authorized the finding for the CIA to kill him. We contracted with people to kill him. I got closer to killing him than anybody's gotten since. And if I were still president, we'd have more than 20,000 troops there trying to kill him. But you know we do have a government that thinks Afghanistan is only one-seventh as important as Iraq. And you got that little smirk on your face, and you think you're so clever. But I had responsibility for trying to protect this country. I tried, and I failed to get bin Laden. I regret it, but I did try. For a little perspective on what you just saw, we are joined tonight by a former advisor to President Clinton, and for that matter, Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Reagan. David Gergen is with us from Texas tonight. David, you worked in the Clinton White House. I covered the Clinton White House. On the Clinton temper scale, this is only a four or a five out of ten. We both know that, but having, having said that, what do you think sparked it? What's behind it? Well, it wasn't a 10. He never got beat red. Uh, I tell you what I think sparked it. He'd just come off a terrific week as ex-president, raised over $7 billion for worthy causes, walked to an into an interview with Fox with Chris Wallace that he thought was going to be at least half about his initiative, and then he thought he got sandbagged by this question that was... The, the question is, from Chris's point of view, I'm sure was legitimate, but from his point of Clinton's point of view was, you're trying to sandbag me with a question which echoes the, the conservative criticisms that you're trying to set me up as a guy who failed to get bin Laden, my administration failed, and that therefore I'm responsible for 9-11. The president completely, President Clinton completely rejects that. He's angry that that's out there, and he's willing to, if somebody's going to punch him with that, he's a fellow who's going to punch back. Now, do you think this makes for a distraction, another target for the Republicans, or do you think Democrats among themselves will use this to say, here's how we ought to be talking? Well, of course, there are some Republicans salivating over that clip because it, uh, it, it, you don't usually see a president that angry, uh, even a former one. But I, I tell you what, uh, the, the President Clinton's uh, office today was flooded with calls, congratulatory, congratulatory calls. I think this is going to have a symbolism that goes beyond the interview. It's going to be a rallying cry for Democrats because Bill Clinton has sent a very clear message to Democrats. If you get bullied, if they try to roll over you, you've got to punch back and punch back hard. That's the way to win. That's the way I won. Remember, you had that sister soul job moment before he got elected in 92. This was another symbolic moment. David Gergen, we sure appreciate you joining us tonight from Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now to Iraq. News today that three U.S. Marines, all from California's Camp Pendleton, will face court-martial on murder charges for the shooting of an Iraqi civilian last April. This incident, you may recall, happened in the town of Hamdaniya, west of Baghdad. The Marines will not, however, face the death penalty. Some will call this a victory for common sense. Others say it's just more confusion in the air. Today, we learned the government rolled back, but only somewhat, those restrictions that it imposed just weeks ago regarding the right to carry liquids or gels, even baby food, on board an airplane. 
NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has our report tonight on the rules that are changing once again. Any type of liquid whatsoever cannot go through the security checkpoint. For nearly seven weeks, they've thrown it all away. Liquids, gels, aerosols, anything in a carry-on bag. Whatever you got to do for the safety, I believe that's, that's first and foremost. So, I think it's all silly. I don't feel any more secure one way or the other. Now, after consulting with the FBI, government laboratories, and foreign governments, the TSA says it can modify the ban without compromising safety. We now know enough to say that a total ban is no longer needed from a security point of view. So effective tomorrow, passengers will be allowed to carry on one quart-sized plastic baggie containing shampoo, mouthwash, hair gel, shaving cream, as long as it's three ounces or less. Another change, beverages bought in the secured boarding area can also be brought on board. The total liquid ban has led to a 20% increase in checked bags, straining luggage handlers and security screeners. But while airline security has improved dramatically since 9-11, the TSA still doesn't have the technology in place to screen every bag for liquid explosives. A gaping hole, say experts, in the nation's security blanket. The technology is not there to detect the liquid explosives. These are actually precursor chemicals that would be mixed into an explosive mixture on board the aircraft. Several companies are working to develop the technology, but in the meantime, the TSA is convinced the amounts of liquids and gels it's allowing on board now are too small to pose a risk. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. We are back with NBC News in depth tonight. The latest report on the housing market is out, and according to a lot of economists and analysts, the housing bubble has indeed and officially deflated. According to the numbers out today, sales of existing homes fell for the fifth straight month in August. But here is the number that really got people's attention today. The median home price fell on a yearly basis by 1.7 percent. This is the first time the price of a house has dropped year over year since 1995. NBC News Chief Financial Correspondent Ann Thompson is with us from a suburban neighborhood in nearby New Jersey. Ann, good evening. Good evening, Brian. For most Americans, it's their biggest investment, and expectations about how much they could get for their homes have skyrocketed in recent years, sometimes to ridiculous heights. Well, now house prices have changed direction, and they are actually falling. Pushing prices down are the growing number of for sale signs going up. Today, there are too many houses for too few buyers willing to pay prices they think are still too high. The seller's market has turned into a buyer's market. That's why prices have come down over the last 12 months. And that's why they will continue to come down over the next six months. The biggest price drop came in the Northeast, the 3.9% decline from August 2005 to this August, followed by the South and Midwest. Only in the West did prices go up. Sue Spendley is a realtor in Massachusetts where prices fell 8% last month, according to the Warren Group. Has a one car garage. To move their home, she's telling sellers to drop their prices. News that's yes, hard to hear, but she's taking to heart, making three price cuts since July on her own three bedroom house, slicing $45,000 from the original asking price. When we weren't getting the traffic, we knew that we had to get aggressive in the pricing. Jack Kaiser, chief economist for Los Angeles County Economic Development, remembers the early and mid-90s when housing prices in California's Antelope Valley didn't just fall, they collapsed as the dominant defense industry cut jobs. He doesn't see history repeating itself. It won't be like the mid-90s because the economy is strong. In uh, the early 1990s, our economy was in the tank, recession and restructuring, very painful. Analysts say the big losers in this market are speculators who bought last year at the top looking to make a quick profit. But for most other homeowners who've owned their homes for more than three years, they should be okay because they'll still be able to profit from double-digit appreciation rates during the boom. Brian? Ann Thompson on the housing market tonight. Ann, thanks for that. Tonight in the ongoing fight against the wildfires in California, a new weapon has become visible in the sky in recent days. A massive, highly modified DC-10 jumbo former passenger jet that is able to dump over 12,000 gallons of fire retardant all at once. And they will need it. The so-called day fire, which started on Labor Day, is still burning through 210 square miles so far. 
Now to our series of reports, The Fleecing of America, which will be airing, by the way, all this week. Tonight, a project that sounded to a lot of people like a great idea, a new visitor center in the U.S. Capitol. A massive underground complex designed for the millions of tourists who come to see the Capitol building each year. NBC News correspondent Chip Reed explains why some are now calling this the Fleecing of America. Critics call it the Pig Dig, a massive construction project they say is pigging out on federal tax dollars right in Congress's front yard. The Capitol Visitor Center, now 85% complete, three stories all underground, state-of-the-art theaters, a great hall, even a 450-seat auditorium. The goal, tighter security and an improved learning experience for millions of tourists. The problem, critics say. We've created this Taj Mahal on the Capitol grounds, a boondoggle. In 1995, it was projected to cost $100 million and to be ready in 1999. But the digging didn't begin until 2002. By then, the cost had ballooned to $265 million and kept growing and growing and growing. The latest estimate, nearly $600 million, and it won't be ready till late next year at the earliest. Just last week, some members of Congress gave the project their Golden Drain Award. The qualifications? Pitiful oversight, exploding costs, and embarrassing results. Critics say there's little question who's at fault. I think Congress should get the lion's share of the blame. Ellis says Congress tacked on hundreds of spending increases, including millions for new office space. Supporters of the project say its scope changed after 9-11, necessitating expensive security upgrades. Defenders of this project often point to that project. When the Capitol Dome was built in the 1860s, the final price tag was $1 million, 10 times the original estimate. There was a flood of criticism then, too, but it all stopped when they saw the final product. So, might the criticism end here after this is complete? Depends on whom you ask. It is the Capitol building, so it is a national monument, so in that aspect, it's worth it. A half a billion on, for what? For a project that some say spiraled out of control right under Congress's nose. Chip Reed, NBC News, the Capitol. On Wall Street today, the Dow was up more than 67 points. NASDAQ was up more than 30 on today's trading. Now to an endangered cat who traveled a long way to find a new home. Leo is his name. He's an orphan snow leopard cub, and he made his debut at the Bronx Zoo here in New York today, almost two months after he was flown in from Pakistan. Leo's mother was killed in a landslide, and a Pakistani shepherd rescued him and turned him over to wildlife officials. The Bronx Zoo has a renowned captive breeding program for snow leopards, which are listed currently as critically endangered around the world. There's a football game in New Orleans tonight, but it hardly stops there. It's the home opener for the New Orleans Saints, and few people really thought their home, the Superdome, would be ready for it. It was pummeled by Katrina back when we rode out that storm inside of it, and frankly, a lot of us thought it would have to be torn down. It was the site of great sadness and death. That's why tonight is more of a reawakening under that dome and for miles around, really. From our New Orleans bureau tonight, here is NBC's Martin Savage. In New Orleans, they can't wait for their saints or themselves to go marching in. An icon of the city, the Superdome suffered so much during Katrina. Wind got underneath, and you can imagine what a 150 mile an hour wind would do. And once that infiltrates, that's what we're seeing. That's what you're hearing. And it became a symbol of suffering to so many afterwards. Get us out of here! We want to get out of here! The damage and the memories were so bad, some people thought it ought to be torn down, which is why to a lot of people today isn't a reopening, but a resurrection. This is fantastic. We're back at the Superdome. No stadium in America has been so heavily damaged and rebuilt in a year. We had 850 men and women working on this building at one point in time. Doug Thornton's the man credited with getting the job done, including replacing the dome itself, all 9.7 acres. He says the challenge wasn't just to repair, but in some cases remove reminders of the past. It was important to us to have people come in and go, wow, or to see a different look. It's just different than what they saw the last time they were here. Still, he knows there are some who can't face coming back. Can you blame them? I can't blame them at all. He can't blame them because Thornton was with them. 
during it all seven terrible days and remains haunted by the faces he can still see. She was parked right over here. Like stool. the old woman on a stool near the elevator. I, I saw her for three days in a row. And the fourth day I walked by and she was no longer there. And you wonder, where'd she go? What happened to her? But the dome is a different place now, Thornton says. Much more than just a stadium. People are going to look at it and they're going to be inspired and they're going to believe if that place can be rebuilt, after all that went on there, there's hope for my neighborhood. There's hope for my city. No longer a symbol of the past, the Superdome has become a beacon for the future. Martin Savage, NBC News, New Orleans. And we're thinking of all our friends in New Orleans tonight. That's our broadcast for this Monday night. Thank you for being with us. I'm Brian Williams. As usual, we'll look for you right back here tomorrow evening. Good night. <laughs>